Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to talk about a case from 1993. Still good law, but it's a bit of a fun one because it answers one of those weird questions. So the, what this one answers is the question of, can a dog be a weapon? This is the case of the Queen and McLeod. Let's have a look at what's going on. So this is a crown appeal of an acquittal at the trial level on the charge of assault with a weapon to wit a dog. Now, the trial court, actually, the trial itself proceeded in a very unusual fashion, which was that both Crown and Defense agreed on what the facts were and then simply argued the legal point. This is something that can happen, and often there's agreements on certain facts, but maybe not others, just to simplify a trial. But it looks like on this one they just agreed to everything to argue the legal issues. Doesn't happen often, but there's no reason why it can't when you've got sort of a central legal issue here. However, we'll come back to how this may have changed things a little bit later. So they've got this, and now we've got the reasons here. These are the reasons of the trial judge. So we haven't gotten to the appeal itself. There are three charges against the accused, two of common assault under Section 266, to which she entered a plea of guilty, and a third count that in committing the assault set out in Count 1, that is the assault on Karen Mary Woodcock, the accused used a weapon, her dog, contrary to the provision in the criminal code. The accused has admitted in an agreed statement of facts, first, that she sicked her dog, a pit bull, upon a dog owned by the complainant. There was no evidence as to whether or not the dog heeded that command or did anything with respect to it. Secondly, and I'm going to read exactly what was said, the accused told the dog to sick the complainant, and the dog then jumped at the complainant and bit the complainant's hand, breaking the skin on the thumb and first finger. Just as a note, uh, often in terms of legal discussions, we won't necessarily talk about the victim because until the trial is done, you don't necessarily know if somebody is a victim or not. So we'll use the language of complainant because if it's alleged that I went and attacked somebody, they're the complainant because we don't want to presume that that happened, which using the language of victim does because that person might be lying. They might... Uh, that might not have actually happened. It might have been that they attacked me and I defended myself. So that's why the complainant language gets used. So going back to it, uh, the dog did then follow the command given to it by its owner, the accused. Uh, I think I can take judicial notice of the fact that when a dog is sicked upon another person, I do not know whether sick is even a word that the English dictionaries recognize, but it is recognized in everyday common language. It means to, in effect, attack the person to whom the dog is directed. The question then arises, and it is the sole question for determination, whether or not a dog is a weapon as defined in Section 2 of the Criminal Code. The word weapon is described as being, first, anything used or intended for use in causing death or injury to persons, whether designed for that purpose or not, or anything used or intended for use for the purpose of threatening or intimidating any person. There is no question that the complainant was injured, whether she was threatened or intimidated, I do not know because there was nothing to indicate that she was, and that really is not an issue here. And the reason why they say it's not an issue here is that once we already got the, uh, the injury, we don't really care about the threatening. They don't need it. The Crown's position is that the words, whether designed for that purpose or not, must include an animate object, such as this dog, which, in the Crown's opinion, becomes an extension of the owner of the animal who commands that the animal attack, which this animal did. Ms. Blakely's position is that the, this definition in the code does not include an animate object, so this is the defense position, and that animate objects cannot and are not weapons which fall within the definition, and that the word anything does not include an animate object, such as an animal or the dog in question. She says her submission is strengthened by the words which follow the last word in paragraph B of the definition, and, without restricting the generality of the foregoing, includes any firearm as defined in section 84. And they note that this is the uh, first time that a court has been uh, called upon to answer this question, but they skip ahead. Uh, there was uh, pictures provided of dogs being used to control crowds, dogs trained for the purpose of controlling crowds, and that these dogs can, I think from what we know and from what we've seen and heard, inflict injury and harm. But that being the case, is the dog an extension of the individual who is controlling the dog? I do not think so. 
I think the dog is trained for the particular purpose and follows the commands given to it, but I go back to say that if Parliament had intended animate objects such as a dog to be included in the definition of the word weapon, it would have said so and or sent in, and I repeat, clear and unambiguous terms, and having failed to do so, I cannot read into the definition of the word weapon, the animate object of a dog. So at the trial level, what the judge determined was that Parliament hadn't specifically spelled out that it includes animals, and so the trial judge was not willing to go further to say maybe it's a weapon. Now, in terms of that, just sort of thinking about it, I can see the argument there in terms of the, uh, you know, Parliament's language. But certainly, in my experience, I have seen dogs used in a weapon-like fashion. Uh, certainly, police dogs, for instance, might be sent after somebody with instructions to go bite them. And that can cause pretty serious injury. So, this one could go either way. Let's, uh, you know, or at least could at this stage. But we'll see what the uh, the appeals court does because they're reviewing this decision. So this is back to the, uh, the appeals court speaking now, or writing anyway. The offense created by Section 267 is a more serious offense than simple assault, uh, envisaged in 266, where the maximum penalty is only five years. Section 267 reads, Everyone in, who, in committing an assault, carries, uses, or threatens to use a weapon or an imitation thereof, or causes bodily harm to the complainant, is guilty of an indictable offense and liable to imprisonment for a term not exceeding 10 years. A uh, weapon used in Section 267 is defined in Section 2 in these words. Weapon means anything used or intended for use in causing injury or causing death or injury to persons, whether designed for that purpose or not, or anything used or intended for use for the purpose of threatening or intimidating any person, and without restricting the generality of the foregoing, includes any firearm defined in Section 84. So there has been some amendment. This is not the current wording of that definition, but that's the definition that existed at the time. So skipping ahead a little bit here, there's a, uh, a bit of a historical argument that gets made. And what this is, is that the defense brings up a previous wording of the weapon definition, in order to argue that dogs are not part of it. And so they note that at 1892, uh, the term offensive weapon is defined in these words. The expression offensive weapon includes any gun or other firearm or air gun or any part thereof, or any sword, sword blade, bayonet, pikes, pike head, spear, spearhead, dirk, dagger, knife, or other instrument intended for cutting or stabbing, or any metal knuckles or other deadly or dangerous weapon, and any instrument or thing intended to be used as a weapon, and all ammunition which may be used with or for any weapon. And the court says, if this definition was operative today, I would, applying the adjudum generis rule, accede to the argument that animate beings do not fall within it. Now, this is a, a Latin maxim, and thankfully the court is... These days, there's a move away from sort of this unnecessary use of Latin. But essentially, what this tells, what this maxim is for, is where we see this kind of listing of things. That listing of things gives us an indication of what they're talking about. And so, where we have this listing of pike heads, spears, spearhead, etc., that gives us an impression of what sort of uh, item they're talking about. And that doesn't seem to include dog. But uh, they say they're not going to look at all the changes in the legislation from 1892 to 1993, which is good because I wouldn't want to go over that either. But now, or at least now in 1993, uh, offensive weapon or weapon means anything that is designed to be used as a, a weapon or anything that a person uses or intends to use as a weapon, whether or not it is designed to be used as a weapon, and without restricting the generality of the foregoing, includes any firearm def as defined in Section 82. And then we have weapon, anything used or designed for, or used or intended for use in causing death or injury to persons, whether designed for that purpose or not, or anything used or intended for use for the purpose of threatening or intimidating any person, and again, includes a firearm. 
they've harmonized these definitions in modern legislation such that uh, there's just the one definition, but uh, moving on. So it will be seen the present definition is no longer confined to anything designed to be used as a weapon or anything used or intended to be used as a weapon. The meaning of the word weapon within the prior definition has become irrelevant in cases such as Laidley, uh, where the Ontario Court of Appeal considered this question, are of no assistance in construing the present definition. The focus of the definition has been shifted from the character of the instrumentality in question to the result of its use or the purpose for which it was used. And since then, it's been shifted again to include both of these elements. But if we see the older definitions, they're very much focused on what kind of object it is. And they're saying, well, now they're talking about more what you do with it, what you're planning to do with it. Skipping ahead a little bit, they, uh, this is counsel for the accused, so defense, uh, saying the definition of weapon has evolved from providing a list of standard offensive weapons, which would commonly be used in an assault type situation, to its current more general definition. However, it is submitted that the evolution of the definition of weapons has not become so encompassing that one can imply that Parliament has, in the progression of the definition, expressly included animate objects such as canines. Fair enough. That's it's not a bad argument, although we'll see how it does. Counsel for the accused sought to uphold this acquittal on an alternative basis. His submission was that there was little or no evidence to suggest that the accused had had appropriate control or decision-making capacity over the dog. Because there was a reasonable doubt as to the dog's level of compliance and training, the accused should be entitled to the benefit of, of doubt. In view of the stance taken by counsel for the accused at trial, where all of the essential ingredients of the offense were admitted except the question of law as to whether a dog could be a weapon, I do not propose to address that additional issue. That problem may arise in some other case and will be more appropriately dealt with in light of facts supporting such an argument. So this is where we see that the trial strategy of the defense may have been a mistake. And what I mean by that is because they admitted everything at the trial except this legal issue, now they're saying, well, whoa, 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 whoa. There's no evidence that this dog was under control. And... You know, if you think about that, a really well-trained dog might do exactly what you tell it to. But let's say you just get a dog at the pound and you don't know its, you know, history and it turns out, you know, somebody abused this dog. It's a bit of a, a wild card and the dog just goes and bites somebody, even though you're chasing after the dog going, Fluffy, no! That's a different scenario, right? Dog, go bite this person versus, no, stop, as it's biting somebody is going to have different implications for your culpability. Certainly, you're not going to be convicted of assault with a weapon for your dog running off contrary to your efforts to keep it there and biting somebody. So now they're saying, we want to argue this issue at the appeal. And the appeal court says, you can't do that. You admitted it. And maybe they could have fought, this, fought over this if they'd done so at the trial, but they didn't. So this is a bit of an attempt to go back on their word and go back on their agreements. And it shows that maybe that strategy wasn't the best. Maybe they should have kept this issue as one they, they fought originally. We'll uh, see a little bit more on that a little later as well as to why that strategy might not have been uh, their best strategy. The approach I take is to determine, if possible, the grammatical and ordinary meaning of the words in the definition of the word weapon in section 2. The key to the resolution of the problem is whether a dog or other animate being falls within the concept of anything. And anything is really broad, right? So we kind of have a feeling of where this might go, but let's have a look. The trial judge concluded that a dog did not. Anything in the Shorter Oxford Dictionary has two meanings. One, a combination of any and thing in the widest sense of the latter. And two, thing of any kind. Unlike the trial judge, I'm unable to discern that the definition of anything is restricted to inanimate items or excludes animate ones. As anything is a composite word, I turn next to the Shorter Oxford meanings given for the word thing. 
I do not propose to reproduce all possible meanings of the word, save to observe that its scope is very, very broad. Included in those meanings are the, these at paragraph three, applied usually with qualifying word to a living being or a creature, occasionally to a plant. Four, applied to a person, now only in contempt, reproach, pity, or affection, uh, formerly in commendation or honor. And five, a material object, a body, a being, or entity consisting of matter or occupying space. So, already we can see some problems here, right? From these meanings, I conclude that when Parliament employed the word anything, that word included both animate and inanimate bodies. Accordingly, a dog can be used or intended to be used as a weapon. The concept of an animate thing used to cause injury or to threaten is not inherently absurd. To handle a poisonous snake in a manner intended to threaten or intimidate, or to use a living thing to inflict actual injury, are but two examples. And we can think of some additional examples here, right? Like, let's say you really hated somebody, and, and this is not a suggestion, but, you know, this is an example, and, you know, you opened up their window and you threw in a poisonous snake or a venomous snake and but you know you shook up that snake so it's real angry and then you chuck it through the window and the snake goes and bites that person and they die well it's not you know you're the person at fault there you're using the snake to cause the problems so saying well you know snake does what snake wants isn't exactly going to uh, to solve the issue there or if you know somebody is allergic to bees and you take a bee in your finger and sort of roll it up until it's really angry and just hold the stinger up against somebody and it stings them and they die, that kind of seems equivalent to if you just stab them and they die. So this, this makes some sense too. It's not just that this is crazy talk. This is not one of these cases where I think the judge really went off the rails here. And in fact, this makes a lot of sense to me. So in the case at bar, the animate thing was a dog whose use was effective only if it obeyed instructions. This makes sense. If you tell tell your dog, you know, my dogs are not very well behaved. behaved. I'm not a great dog trainer. If I told my dog, go bite that person, the dog would sort of look at me and go, mm, nah. So fair enough. The evidence admits of no doubt. The accused intended the result which followed her command to the dog. The constituent elements of section 267.1a are made out. The accused, in the course of committing an assault, used a weapon, namely an animate thing, thereby causing injury to the victim. I am therefore of the view that this appeal must be allowed and the acquittal set aside and a conviction entered. The matter will be remitted to the Supreme Court of the Yukon Territory for sentencing. So this is what I mean when I say that there's going to be a little bit more discussion of the fact that uh, this admitting everything thing might come back to bite them. Bite them. <laughs> I didn't intend that, but it's kind of good. And the reason why here is that having admitted all of the facts, this allows the appellate court to just say, we're going directly to sentencing, you're not getting another trial. Whereas if this has been contested, if there had been arguments over all of these things, the court may actually have been in a position of having to say, listen, some of these issues weren't decide or weren't clear, and so this has to go back for another trial, which gives them a better chance at uh, sort of prevailing on the appeal. All of these are strategic questions. You know, I wasn't counsel at this uh, stage, so I can't comment as to, you know, the strength of the case or what was going on here, but... These are implications that sometimes come up, and it's really hard as trial counsel to necessarily know what the future is going to bring and what the best strategy is. Um, no trial strategy is perfect, and often the things you might have gotten wrong only come up at an appeal or in hindsight. It's just part of the nature of the game and part of the nature of the job. It's, it can be hard for that reason because there's a lot of second guessing. There's no, well, I'd say any defense lawyer who really sort of thinks about what they're doing is going to have had trials where you walk out and you go, man, I wish I'd done that other thing. You know, I wish I'd taken a different approach. I wish I'd, you know, asked this other question. I wish I hadn't asked this other question. It just happens. 
But on the topic of animals being used as weapons, we have an example that I found in the news. And this, of course, is an example out of Florida. And it's from 2016. Florida man arrested for allegedly tossing alligator into Wendy's drive through window. And we see the man faces multiple charges, including assault with a deadly weapon. So apparently Florida seems to recognize that an alligator might be a weapon as well. And we've got a picture of the alligator and a picture of the gentleman. So this uh, doesn't appear to be a result that is sort of unique to Canada. Um, but as I said, when we think about sort of examples it makes some sense that this might be included as a weapon. You know, a police dog. If a police officer, and those dogs are very well trained, they, you know, they tend to do exactly what the officer tells them. If you have somebody who's in handcuffs, for instance, and the police officer says, you know, dog, bite that person. We think of that, you know, in that case, it seems like a weapon. You know, similarly, the bees example, the snake example, any of those sorts of things uh, could potentially be a weapon in those senses, at least in our common understanding. So this case, to my mind, makes a fair bit of sense. It's one of these things that seems fairly obvious. But let's think a little bit about some of the possible implications of this. Because let's say, for instance, that you train your dog for the specific purpose of your dog being able to to do these things. You know, if you have your dog well trained with attack as a potential element to it. Well, now we might start wondering, is this dog now designed to be used as a weapon, which would make it a weapon? Can we get in situations where you might be charged with carrying a concealed weapon because you have, you know, hidden your dog away? What about possession of a weapon for purposes dangerous to the public peace? If you're walking, you know, your dog because you want to go to the store and you feel safer with your dog because your dog might stop a intruder. I'm not so comfortable with that. You know, if a woman buys a dog because she feels safer walking around her neighborhood late at night with the dog and, you know, thereby getting some exercise, uh, it starts to make me a little less comfortable when I think about that. Um, the other thing that makes me a little less comfortable is if we start talking about search and seizure provisions. So let's say the you and you're in a messy divorce and, you know, somebody says something heated and they're coming to seize all of your weapons. We start getting a little more uncomfortable if we start talking about the crown in that case, maybe seizing your dog and that dog possibly being forfeited to her majesty. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. Like in this situation where this woman, you know, may have told the dog to sick on somebody. Are we going to say that the dog is now a fence related property and it should be taken away and, you know, and destroyed potentially? Uh, I mean, I'm torn on that one because... On one hand, you know, that's maybe not the best behavior, but like it's a dog, right? Uh, I think of, you know, John Wick, and John Wick would not be happy about uh, this sort of idea of, you know, dog being forfeited to the queen. So as much as this sort of makes sense when we think about somebody doing an actual assault with a dog... It starts leading me to some uncomfortable thoughts when I start extending it that little bit further. So I don't really know ultimately how I feel entirely about it, but regardless of how I feel, this is the law and that's the one we're, uh, we're stuck with. So be aware of it and don't sick your dog on anybody unless you're in a life or death situation because you really would hate to have your dog forfeited to Her Majesty the Queen. I understand she only really likes, uh, what is it, uh, corgis, so, and doesn't own any at this point. Anyway, I hope you found this to be interesting and educational. If you have, please like, share, and subscribe. I also want to thank my $10 Patreons, my buddy Keith, Process Eng, Stephen Larson, Mark D, General Counsel of the CCFR, John Robinson, Tim Rogers, Roy Haddock, Thrackles Dak, Jean-Alexandre Tessier, 
Cameron Johnson, Sir Goat, Sights and Arms Limited, Chaba Hollow, Peter Heinem, Craig Kwan, Akin Coxall, North Central Process Service, Toys R for Boys, Ian Vaughn, Milan Vrechik, or Vrekic, I think I've got it right on that second one, again, I'm sorry, Terence Griffiths, Doug Thompson, Malcolm Taylor, and a special thank you to $30 supporter Steve Browning. Once again, thank you for your support. Thank you for watching. Uh, there's a link to my Patreon below. Thank you once again, and I hope I've armed you with knowledge.